All right, uh, we are right in the middle of chapter two. Again, if you're new here, we've been going through the entire book of 1 Timothy. Um, last week, we saw that Paul was kind of giving some general commands for the church at Ephesus. He was saying, I desire that everybody to pray and God's heart and desire is for all people to be saved, which is why we should pray for all people. And so it was really general commands for the church as a whole. And now as we transition starting into verse eight, we're gonna see that Paul gets more specific specific. He went from encouraging the church in general, saying, hey, here's the things all you guys should be doing. Now he gets more specific and he focuses specifically on men. Here's what I want you to be focusing on. Here's some of your roles in the church. And then women, here's some things that I want you to focus on and some things um, that you can partake in in the church. And so um, Paul starts with the men in verse eight, and here's what he says. He says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So Paul here, as he's moving from general, the whole church to specific, Paul first expresses his strong desire for the men in the church to take initiative and responsibility in the area of prayer. Now, what is important to note is that although Paul is addressing the men, he's saying, men, I desire that you guys pray, Paul's not implying that women are off the hook and never have to pray. And again, that's important to note, right? He's like, well, women, you never have to pray. Just let the men do that. Paul was addressing the men in prayer because the men had a specific unhealthy tendency and temptation not to pray. He knew that this was a weakness in their life spiritually. He knew this was something they struggled with. And so they needed encouraged in it. And I would say even today, this is probably something a lot of guys struggle with. I find that women in general are more prone to pray and men are typically more passive and have a more difficult time with it. And so Paul's saying, I'm challenging the men in this because this is an area where you guys need to grow. And so Paul is ultimately saying, wherever God's people gather together, men, we have to fight against the spiritual passivity that we even see in the book of Genesis where Adam spiritually passively stood by as Eve ate of the fruit. He's saying, men, we have to fight against this. We have to fight the spiritual passivity and we have to take initiative in prayer. Now notice as well, he says, I desire that they pray in every place. In the context here, in, in every place, would specifically be applied to the various house churches that made up the Ephesian church as a whole. If you've been tracking with us in the series, as Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, it's to the church of Ephesus. There wasn't just like one big mega church in Ephesus. The way the early church was structured is that mainly there was hundreds, if not thousands of small churches that met in people's houses. And so when Paul says, I desire men to pray everywhere, he's saying this is a principle applicable to all the churches throughout the whole region of Ephesus, that whoever the leaders and the men are, in those church, take initiative in prayer. Be praying for the church, be praying for the people, be praying for the leaders. This is for all the churches. And notice as well, he says, I desire that they pray with holy hands. Now, what's interesting here is that there was, uh, at this time, there was a, uh, 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 for the Jews, they had these rituals, the Jewish people, they had these rituals of washing their hands before meals and washing their hands before prayer because they thought that these ceremonial washings of the hands, they thought that these are what purified somebody. They thought that by going through these ceremonies of washing your hands, this is what ultimately makes you pure and what makes you holy. But when Paul says, I desire the men to pray with holy hands, he's not saying, hey, go through all all the rituals, he's implying that when we come to pray, uh, we should be cleansed of spiritual defilement and impurity. He's saying, I want from the place and the posture of your heart, I want you to be pure. I want you to be holy before the Lord. And so to pray with holy hands is ultimately, it's to pray out of the character of a holy heart. Holy hands are a result of a holy heart. Even, even the scripture says that it's, it's from within that a person is defiled. Even the Pharisees, they looked so good on the outside, but their hearts were defiled. And so when Paul's telling the men, I want you to pray with holy hands, he's ultimately saying, check your heart. Is the holiness in your life, is it coming from within? And the psalmist said this in Psalm 24, verse three and four, in connection with this, listen to what the psalmist said. He said, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? I, I wanna do that. I wanna ascend the hill of the Lord. I wanna stand in God's holy place. Who shall do it? He says, he who has clean hands 
and a pure heart. So again, the connection here of Paul saying, I desire men to play, pray with holy hands. Holy hands, clean hands comes from a holy heart and a pure heart. And so the implication for the men is, if you're coming to pray before God, if you're coming to pray before the Lord, and you know that there is some unrepented sin in your life, if you know there is some impurity and some issues in your life, he's saying, first and foremost, repent of those things. He's not saying you can't pray if you're not perfect. But he's saying, when you do come to pray, if there's hidden things in your life, though, that should be the starting point in prayers. Wow, God, create in me a clean heart, as David said. Create in me a clean heart so that my heart may be cleansed, so that my hands may be cleansed. I repent of these things so that my prayers might not be hindered. And so ultimately, this is the, the thing that Paul is saying for the men in the church. I know that this is a struggle for you. For the men in the church, I know we can be prone to spiritual passivity, but he's saying, I want you to be leaders in prayer. I want I want you to be leading your families in prayer, the church in prayer, praying for the nation, praying for the community. This is something that men need to pursue from a place of holy hands, which comes from a holy heart. So again, just an encouragement and a challenge for the men in the, in the congregation today to just check your heart and say, God, like, have I, have, have I been diligent in prayer? Have I been taking you up on this invitation? This is ultimately, this is invitational. It's wow, what a privilege it is that we as men get to come and talk with God and offer requests and prayers and praise. And if I feel like I can't because there's some things in my life, he's saying, deal with that then. C come in repentance, come and confess your sins. And the scripture says, he who confesses his sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Like we, we already have forgiveness because of the atonement of the cross. And so for the men in the church, I wanna challenge us and encourage us um, to continue to pursue prayer, to continue to be leaders in prayer. And just so you guys know, um, we do have a pre-gathering prayer meeting every single Sunday at 8 a.m. Greg and his wife, Bev, lead that. It meets downstairs. So we talked about this more at length last week when Paul said, I desire everyone to pray. If you're feeling called to that and led to that and saying, man, I do wanna press deeper into that. And men specifically for saying, I wanna press deeper into that. Um, you can join us for pre-gathering prayer Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. downstairs. So now, just as Paul says, I desire men to pray in a holy manner, he now transitions and focuses on the women. And look at what he says in verse 9 and 10. He says, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So just as Paul said, men, you are to pray in a holy manner, he now transitions to the women and says, women, likewise, you are to adorn yourselves in a holy and godly manner. Now, again, in a, as Paul now specifically focuses in on the women and addresses the issue of modesty, Again, Paul is not saying, hey men, this is only for the women so you can wear your Speedo to church. This only applies to the women. That's not what he's saying, right? Again, just like the command for men to pray, this was an issue at this time that they were struggling with. He's not saying women don't have to pray. He's not saying men, you shouldn't dress modestly. But again, at this time, when he's pointing out this issue for the women, this was a specific temptation and tendency that many women in the church of Ephesus had fallen into at the time, which is why he is encouraging them and exhorting them in this. Now, what's important to note, because again, we're 2,000 years removed from this, and, and you can read this and be like, wait, what? I'm not allowed to braid my hair or like wear a gold necklace? Like, what's going on here, right? It's important to note that Paul never intended to make this letter a, a, a fashion guide. Like, this is not like, th these, these commands to not braid your hair for the women, to not wear gold and like have nice clothing, this is not to be taken literally. And some people do that and they become very legalistic churches and it's like literally women can't braid their hair and all. That's not what he's getting at here. So just to make that clear for the ladies in the church who wore braids today, we love you. We're glad you're here. If you've got some jewelry on, we're glad you're here. If you wore your favorite outfit, we're glad you're here. None of those things are a sin in and of themselves. So what Paul was getting at uh, is the larger principle of, again, modesty and decency. And so again, defining these in our cultural context is going to look different than they did at this time, but the principle still remains the same. The principle is for the women 
to, uh, to present themselves with modesty. And so again, Paul here is contrasting, ultimately, this is his big idea for the women. Paul is contrasting the outward adornment and beauty, which would draw attention to oneself as a woman or a man. He's contrasting that with the inner beauty, which ultimately brings about godliness and brings attention and glory to God. This is the big idea. And the reason that he brings this up is because at this time, there were, there were women who by their dress and the way that they were carrying and conducting themselves, they were drawing attention to themselves and wanting people to, 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 to marvel and revel in their beauty and they were detracting people's attention from God. So that's what was going on here. Now again, his mention of these specific hairstyles and jewelry and clothing, what's important to note is that in this context, these were very common among wealthy women at this time. And so when Paul in this context speaking to the church of Ephesus says, hey, I, I don't want the women here in this church. I don't want you to braid your hair and have all this fine jewelry and clothing. These prohibitions were aimed at certain women in the church who were flaunting their wealth uh, in a way that would suppress the poor. And this was causing division in the church. And so Paul is again addressing a very specific situation here. And he's ultimately saying that the church, when the church comes together, the church is to be a place where there is equality before God, where women and men uh, who are wealthy and poor can come together as the body of Christ. And there's not factions and there's not divisions and there's not, oh, well, we dress nicer so we get the better seats in the house. Those are the things that was going on, which is why ultimately Paul is bringing this up. Likewise, Rome at this time, it was really known for its decadent, fashion and the empress of Rome was ultimately the prime model and so there were women all throughout the Greco-Roman world at this time who were eager to follow and copy the elaborate hairstyles and fashion trends of the empress of Rome now again ladies today you're like we don't have anything like that going on right like TikTok, uh, Instagram, your favorite celebs on the map. No, we don't compare ourselves and try to follow the trends of these people who we look up to, right? So this has no application to us. No, it clearly has application. Again, it looks different. We don't have an empress of America who you're like, whoa, I wanna be just like her. But we do have in our day and age, this is a struggle for a lot of women and probably some men as well, that you wanna be seen. That you, that you want to be known, that you want to be with the in crowd, that you want to look a certain way that all these other people look and wear the certain things that they wear and have the jewelry that they have. It's the exact same principle, just a different context. We don't have the Empress of Rome. We have TikTok. We, we have makeup celeb tutorial vids. And you're like, I have to have that makeup if I'm going to be beautiful, right? It's the exact same principle, different context. And so Paul here, again, he is encouraging women to live lives that are marked by modesty rather than vanity. This is the big picture. He's saying for the women in the church, which is applicable for the men as well, but specifically the women struggled with it, women should conduct themselves in a way and live a life of modesty rather than vanity. And so the picture here of a godly woman, what he's, what he's encouraging women in, is that they should see the vanity that is in the world. They should see it for what it is. And they should be marked by self-control, which is a fruit of the spirit. He's saying for the women in the church, he says, again, in verse nine, he says, with modesty and self-control, we should not be enticed by the things of the world. We, not, we should not have to look like and try to fit into the world and the trends. And so ultimately this exhortation that Paul's giving to the women in the church of Ephesus I believe that it is just as relevant for women today as it was 2,000 years ago. I believe that, again, in the same way that men today struggle with spiritual passivity and may struggle to lead spiritually in prayer, this is something that still women struggle with today. The culture that we live in currently is constantly targeting women, saying that in order to be beautiful, in order to find your true value, in order to be accepted in society, here's all the things you have to do. You, you have to have the certain body type. You have to wear these certain brands of clothing. You have to have a certain amount of plastic surgery. You have to wear a certain type of makeup. You have to drive a certain type of car. And of course, don't forget the Hermes clutch, right ladies? Like you have to have that if you're gonna fit into the mold of what culture says. This is what a real woman looks like. And so ultimately, again, this is something where Paul is saying for the women in the church, I want your life to be marked by modesty and godliness and, and self-control and you should be known for your your good works. And so while many women 
give free reins to their desires and to their appetites and to all these things that the world says, here's the things you have to do. Here's the mold you have to conform to. Paul is saying a a godly woman will distinguish herself by self-control. A godly woman will, will be known by her good works. And a godly woman is not to be primarily concerned with her outward adornment, but with a life that is adorned by godliness, a life that is marked by a pursuit of the person of Jesus. And so for the, the ladies in the house today, and this is applicable for men too, because some guys struggle with this as well. Um, the, the, the question for us in light of this, it would simply be this, is are we more concerned with our clothing than we are character? This is the big idea. Paul's saying we're, don't, the, the, the outward adornment, don't worry about that. It's our character that we be known for godliness. Are you more concerned with your clothing or with your character? This is an important question I think that all of us can ask, right? We, we're, we're all sucked into this social media bubble and trying to follow the trend. Man, what's most important in your life? Is it the clothing you wear or is it the character of what God is producing in you? Are you more concerned with how you are looking or who you're becoming? This is a good question. What's my main focus when I, when I wake up and, and go to work? When I wake up and go to church, is it how am I gonna be perceived? How am I looking? Am I gonna fit in? Or is it who am I becoming? What is God doing in me? How can I pursue godliness today? What does it look like to exercise self-control today? Are you known for your good looks or are you known for your good works? This is what Paul says. In the church, they were, whoa, look at me. Whoa, look at her. Look what he has. Look at these jeans. Look at that jewelry. Look at this new hairstyle. Is that, is that what we want to be known for? Or as he says, that we pursue godliness with good works. What, what are you concerned with? Your good looks or your good works? And again, are we focusing on the outward expression of beauty or the inward expression of our faith? This is the big idea. This is what Paul is getting across here. There were women in the church who were so concerned with the outward, but the inward hidden person and the pursuit of faith in a relationship with Jesus, that was lacking because the outward was taking precedence. And so just an encouragement for the women in the church today and maybe some men who would struggle with this as well to to realize that God's heart and design and desire for you and for us as a church is that the focus would be again on the heart. That's the same thing with encouraging the men in the prayer, the holy hands that comes from a holy heart. That's what he's concerned with. God's not looking at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. Man might look at the outward appearance. Wow, look at them. They have it all together. But God is concerned with your heart. And so for the women in the church today, just an encouragement for you that um, you, you don't have to fit the mold of culture. You don't have to have that type of clothing, wear that type of makeup, get that type of surgery to be a woman of God. You can pursue a relationship with Jesus. You can be known by your godliness and your good works. You can have self-control by the power of the spirit. And that's ultimately what God is concerned with. Amen? Amen. Okay, now I am going to read verses 11 through 15, which if you're familiar with 1 Timothy, I know why you guys are here today. This is what you want to hear. I am just going to read it as it is and then... We will take some time exploring this. This is gonna be kind of the main portion for this morning. If you're new to church and you've never heard this, please, ladies, hang in there. I promise this is, just hang in there, okay? So Paul writes in verse 11, he says this, let a woman learn quietly. (sighs) Wow. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. I didn't know that um, 
that that would be so difficult for me to do, but um, this is a passage of scripture um, which has been something that I have wrestled with for a long time and which has affected and impacted many of my closest relationships with people both inside and outside the church. And um, even in studying and preparing for this, this was one of the most difficult studies um, that I've ever done. And I still feel like I've barely even scratched the surface. And I won't be able to communicate with you guys today all of the important truths that come out of this. And so even... Even this weekend on my two days off, I was still like laboring over this. I didn't have a true weekend because this is such an important passage of scripture, but also it's one of the most difficult and debated passages of scripture in the entire Bible. So when it comes to women's roles in the church, which this is what Paul is talking about here, the reality is every single person who's grown up in the church or you're new to church, every single person has a very strong opinion on this subject. And sadly, this has brought out the worst in many people and has caused a lot of harm to people. The, the debates over women in ministry and whether women can or can't teach and pastors and leadership and all of that, this has been a huge point of division in the church for a long, long time. What I wanted to start by saying is that wherever you land on the interpretation of this, and we'll get into that, that this is not a gospel issue, meaning You can be a Christian and faithfully follow Jesus and believe that this is actually saying women cannot be teachers in the church. You can be a Christian and believe that. You can also be a Christian and believe that that's not what's actually going on here. And women can teach in the church and can be pastors and leaders. And if you've only grown up in one church culture, you may not even know that there's churches that practice both. There's some churches that, where, where you find women pastors and teachers, and then there's some where there's not. So again, in the body of Christ, I wanted to start by saying this is not a gospel issue. We can't say, well, this church doesn't allow women teachers, and this one does. Therefore, these ones are teaching the true gospel, and these ones are heretics. That is what we ultimately need to avoid. Sincere believers who are genuinely seeking to follow Jesus, who are wholly committed to the scriptures and the authority of the scriptures, they are on both sides of the issue. Some of my personal favorite pastors and personal mentors are on completely different ends of the spectrum. I don't say, well, you do believe this or you don't believe this, therefore you don't understand the gospel and I can't be discipled by you and I can't learn from you. Again, this for me personally is not a divisive issue, is not something which again affects the gospel as a whole. And so again, I believe that one could build a credible case within the bounds of orthodoxy and a commitment to the inerrancy of the scriptures for either one of these two major views. You could do that. You you could be committed to the scriptures, believing that the scriptures are inspired and inerrant and authoritative and build a credible case for either one of the views. And so again, nobody can assert that a particular view on the issue is the only one reflecting biblical inerrancy. Does that make sense? That's what we have to avoid. And again, some people are very strong on one side or the other. We can't label the other people and say, well, you're not Christians or well, you're heretics. Because, and again, I think this is why I maybe got emotional. What grieves me the most and also what I believe really grieves the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What grieves my heart and the Holy Spirit is really the inexcusable disdain with which each side has treated the other. I've seen this. I've seen the, the demonizing and the we can't do ministry with you or you don't actually fully understand or whatever. Like I, I've seen it in the church. It brings about division and I believe that that grieves the Holy Spirit. And so ultimately, I want to begin with a plea for Christian civility in our discussion on this particular issue. This is what I want to ask of our church and of of our family when it comes to this discussion, this topic, uh, that that we would have civility and, and charity and an open heart to hear somebody who might believe something different on this particular issue. And so I wanna make every effort to portray both sides of this 
very debated passage of scripture. I wanna make every effort to, pray, to portray both sides in the best possible terms to avoid misrepresentation, sarcasm, or caricature. This is, we, we have to just realize there, there is space and there has been space throughout history for people who land in a different position on this issue. And so again, for me, this is an issue where I believe as Christians, we should be able to respectfully agree to disagree. Um, I did a teaching on that in the Q&R series. How do we love those we disagree Agree with even in the body of Christ. If this is something you're struggling with, you can go back and listen to that. That would be a very applicable moment for this teaching today. So as Christians, I believe we should be able to respectfully disagree without calling into question uh, another person's love for Jesus or their commitment to the scriptures. And so again, I wanna challenge our church body as, as we kind of start going down this road and unpacking this to commit ourselves to this sort of dialogue on this subject that would honor Christ and, and that would glorify the person of Jesus and would enhance the church's, uh, the, the, the church's witness in a community. They would enhance our witness in the world rather than tarnish it in a society which already sees the church as its worst enemy. Our, our culture already hates the church and sees us as the greatest enemy. I wanna promote dialogue around this that says, wow, like this enhances people's views of Christianity. That they're not actually just after each other. They can agree and disagree and still love each other and serve each other. So ultimately, wherever you land, wherever we land, uh, we have to check our hearts, we have to check our motives, and we have to continue to look to the scriptures. Um, I did wanna say as well that, uh, again, even among our elder team and our staff and our leadership team here, which I think this is really healthy, there's disagreement on this issue. That's why, by the way, in the Q&R series, we did have a lot of questions that came in about women's roles in ministry and pastoring and teaching. Uh, and we shared with the, the church that we were not ready to go down that road with you guys yet simply because we're still trying to work through this. We're, we're still trying to figure out as a church, what does this mean and look like and how do we do this when even amongst the leaders in our church, there's people on different sides of the aisle. And so that's, that's completely okay. And I think it is healthy. I think it's iron sharpening iron. And so um, we wanna let you guys know that um, at our leadership team here is working uh, on this particular issue and we will be doing a more extensive teaching or even a mini series in the coming season when we have an official church position. So again, we're not gonna get into all the weeds today. I want to try and just explain the basic positions, but to let you guys know, um, our church has not taken an official position on this. Our leadership team is praying through that, trying to work through that. And when we do land where we land, we will keep you guys informed in the process. But for today, the direction I wanted to go um, is to begin with just what are the two primary views on this passage? And some of you, you might not even know that there are two different views. I grew up in a church culture where I didn't know there was Christians who believed anything different on this than I believed. It wasn't until I was in my mid-20s where I was like, wait, what? I didn't know there was Christians who believed that. So again, I wanna start by sharing what are the two primary views on this passage. The first one, if you're note takers, you can write these things down. The first view, the first camp, if you would, uh, would be somebody who uh, calls himself a complementarian the complementarian view. Complementarians believe essentially that this passage is transcultural and that Paul's exhortation is a universal command and therefore it is applicable to all people in all churches throughout all time and therefore it must be upheld by the church today. So a complementarian reading of this passage says, yes, Paul says, I don't permit a woman to teach. That's not her role. She does not have that authority and therefore in churches, we should honor that because that's what the scripture states. This is the complementarian position. The second side of the coin is the egalitarian position. And egalitarians believe that the instructions in this passage, they remain frozen in the first century because Paul's command was for a specific group addressing a specific issue in a specific context, and therefore it does not apply to the church today. So these are the two basic positions when it comes to the issue of women 
in teaching women, pastors, and things of that nature. And so again, when dealing with an issue such as this, what is really important for us to understand, any of these issues that seem to be kind of both sides and what is it, the key for, for you students of the Bible, the, the key things that we need to do as interpreters, we have to look at the immediate context of what's happening in the passage. Anybody who's gonna be faithful to a text, this is what you do. You have to look at the immediate context of what's happening in the passage. You have to look at the context of what's happening in the culture at that time. Because again, this is a letter written to a specific group of people. So what was happening in that culture that made Paul write this? And then number three, you also have to look at the broader context and scope of the scriptures as a whole. Because there's no part of the Bible that will contradict another part of the Bible. So wherever you land on this issue or any issue, these are the things we have to look at. What does this mean in its context right here? What was happening in that culture at that time that prompted the writing? And what does the broader scope of scripture say as a whole? Now again, what I do wanna say is that this is not an issue of chauvinism or discrimination. This isn't, the, the root of this issue is biblical interpretation. Where the division in the camps comes from egalitarians and complementarians is how do we interpret this passage? And so the question is, how does each one interpret this passage and land where they land? And this morning, I want to walk you through that. I want to walk you through how does the complementarian arrive at the understanding that today women still should not be teachers in the church? And how do egalitarians from this passage land at that this is no longer applicable for us today and women can be teachers in the church? How does each one interpret this particular passage? And I wanna start with the complementarian, pa pass, uh, uh, the complementarian position. So the, uh, the, specifically from this text. So for the complementarians, they interpret this passage very literally. They take it at face value and they, they read it very plain and naturally. And there, there are some strengths to that. And there's also some weaknesses to that. But again, the complementarians, they say, it, it seems pretty clear here. It seems pretty clear what Paul's saying. A woman should not teach or have authority over a man in the church. And, and therefore, th that's what the Bible says. And so we're just gonna go with that. So here's the key arguments. Here's how the complementarians interpret this passage. Number one, their, their first main point is that from this passage, we see even before sin entered the world, there was a, a principle of headship and submission. The argument here, they, they, Paul says, I don't permit a woman to teach. And then he goes all the way back saying, Adam was formed first, then Eve. So the complementarian position is rooted in the fact that even before sin entered into the world, Adam was formed first and then Eve. And because Adam was created first and Eve was created to be his helper, Therefore, the man's primary role is that of spiritual responsibility. Because Adam was created first, he was given original authority on the earth. And so in Genesis, again, because that's where Paul takes his argument, he goes back to Adam and Eve. So what the complementarians say is that in the beginning in Genesis, God was establishing order in the family. Adam was created first. He was the authority. He was the head. Eve was created second. And they say that in the same way, the church, which is God's family, that's the primary metaphor used for the church in the New Testament, the church, which is God's family, it follows the same pattern. And therefore, there are different roles between men and women in the church, just as there are different roles between men and women in creation. And what they, I think one of their strongest points and arguments is that in the Garden of Eden, what you see is the, the, this order and these roles that God established there is a complete reversal of those roles at the fall when sin entered into the world. So what you see in the creation narrative is that there was God, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. He is the ultimate authority. He's the primary authority. God then created man, and after, uh, after man from his side, he created the woman. And man and woman both together were to have authority over the earth and even over Satan. So the order in creation, God has ultimate authority. This is the complementarian position. Then men are given spiritual authority. Then women who are also made in God's image, who, who are, are submit to the head, which is man, who submits to Christ. And then Satan is there at the bottom. He has no authority over man, woman, or God. But in the Garden of Eden, what you see happening is a complete complete reversal of the roles. What you see in the garden is the serpent, Satan. 
he took the place of ultimate authority. And then Eve was the one who was tempted at the tree and said, oh, wow, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should eat of the fruit. So Satan had ultimate authority. Eve took the role of spiritual leadership and told her husband, here's what we should do. We should eat the fruit. And God was left completely out of the picture. So the complementary position is that, again, the fall was a result of the complete reversal of roles. Rather than God, man, woman, Satan, you see Satan, woman, man, God. And this is a big part of the complementary understanding as to why God has established this type of order in a family and in the church. So again, their primary argument is rooted in the order of creation. It goes back to creation and they believe as universal application in the family and in the church today. The, the complementarians say that God has chosen to give men the primary teaching authority and spiritual leadership in the church because this is the way that God intended it to be from the very beginning. That Adam was created first and that Eve was created second. The second key element to their argument, so that's the, the, their first main point for the complementarians. Adam was formed first, then Eve. It's very clear from the beginning, God gave man authority and Eve was uh, to be in a support role as man's helper. The second key element to the complementarian argument is notice, um, it says in verse 14, it says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So the second key element to their argument is that Eve was deceived and in her deception, she took the role of spiritual leadership by again telling Adam, Adam, hey, we should eat of this fruit. She was taking the role of a spiritual leader, being deceived, and as a result, sin entered into the world. So the complementarians look at this and they say, this, what happened in the beginning is Eve was deceived by the serpent because she was not fulfilling her role. She took the role of a spiritual authority and Adam submitted to her, and as a result, sin came into the world. So the, 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 the point goes, is that although Eve was deceived and ate of the fruit and gave some to her husband, Adam, here's what's really interesting. What's really interesting is that although that is true, Eve was deceived, ate of the fruit and gave some to her husband who was with her. The reality is when you look at the entirety of the scriptures, the Bible never holds Eve responsible for the fall of the human race, but it always holds Adam responsible because he was given the role of spiritual authority and the head. Even when God shows up in the garden, he says, Adam, where are you? Why would he come after Adam if Eve was the one who was deceived and responsible? It's because God is holding Adam responsible as the spiritual head, even though Eve was deceived. And when you look at the entire New Testament, what you see is the same thing. Anytime original sin is mentioned, it always links it to Adam, even though Eve was the one that was deceived. Romans chapter five, verse 12, for example, and Romans five, you can read the whole chapter later, lays this out very clear, but look at Romans five twelve. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. So Paul says, sin came into the world through one man. That is Adam. But wait, wasn't it Eve who was deceived and ate of the fruit and gave some to her husband? Yes, but God did not hold Eve responsible. He held Adam responsible because, the complementarian says, Adam is responsible because there was a difference in authority. He had been given spiritual authority and although it was Eve who was deceived, Adam is ultimately held responsible because he was given the position of authority. Does that make sense? So this is where the complementarians land and this is again, the way that they interpret this passage. They say that Adam had an authority that Eve didn't have and therefore Adam failed in his responsibility in a far more significant way than Eve did. Yes, Eve was deceived, Adam sinned knowingly and ultimately this is why God holds holds him responsible because God from the beginning, the complementarians say, God from the beginning established order that men would be in the role of spiritual authority. And which is why at the end of the day, Adam is held responsible even though Eve was deceived. It's because Adam passively stood by even as Eve was eating of the fruit. So again, the complementarian position on this is rooted in two main things. They say, number one, we see that from the beginning, God had created man, then woman. There, there is, from the very beginning, creation, there is order, 
and God has established that and desires that to be established throughout all history. And then their second key argument again is that Eve was deceived. However, God held Adam responsible because God created Adam as the head and put him in the place of spiritual authority. So again, this is how the complementarians um, I- interpret this passage of scripture. That's where they land. That's how they land, where they land. And that's why they believe that even in the church today, that women should not be in the role of a pastor or a teacher because of these very things, the argument goes back rooted into creation itself. The second position, which is the egalitarian position, egalitarians, again, they interpret this passage in light of the cultural circumstances happening in Ephesus at this time. And they look at the broader framework of women in ministry throughout the rest of the scripture. So again, neither of these camps is saying, let's just disregard the scripture. Let's just throw it out. Both of them are looking at the scripture, but they're seeing it in a different way. And so here's the key arguments for the egalitarians. Here's how egalitarians interpret this passage and why they believe that women can be in roles of spiritual authority, even in the church today. The first argument from the egalitarian perspective is they say that Paul is not prohibiting all spiritual authority from women, but a certain type of unbiblical authority. Again, if you're a note taker, Paul is not prohibiting all spiritual authority from women, but a certain type of unbiblical authority. This is where their argument begins. It's it's important to note that this uh, that there are in the new in the scriptures there are 47 different words for our English word authority, which is kind of crazy, right? We just say authority. We have one word, kind of maybe like commander or chief. In the Bible, there are 47 different words used for what we say authority. And in this particular instance, when Paul says in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority, the word that Paul uses out of 47 different choices is this Greek word, authenteo, A-U-T-H-E-N-T-E-O, authenteo. And what's interesting is that this is the only time that this word is used in the entire Bible, not to get too nerdy and complex on you, but this is what's called a hypox legomenon, meaning this is the only mention in the whole Bible. You can drop that at a tea party this week. People will be like, whoa, sweet. <laughs> Why that's important is because if you don't have other mentions of any particular word, then it's hard to know what exactly does it mean. It's called a semantic range. What's good when you have other mentions is you go, whoa, this meant this here and this here and this here. And so we kind of have a broader understanding of what's going on. If this is the only mention in the scripture, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to interpret by the scripture itself. And so what is interesting is that this word authenteo, which Paul intentionally used, only time mentioned in the Bible, Apart from scripture in the culture at this time, this word authenteo was originally meant and used when someone murders someone with their own hand. That's what it originally meant in Greek culture. So it's, well, what does Paul mean here then? If he's saying a woman should not have authority, is she saying ladies don't come in and like kill a man? Like what's going on if that's what the word originally meant? Well, over time, this word in Greek culture was as words and language does shift and change. Over time, this word was used for one who acts on their own authority and it meant in this culture to have mastery over or to lord over. And so ultimately what the egalitarians believe is it is a very specific type of authority that Paul is saying women should not exercise over a man. And so uh, if Paul was prohibiting, they argue, if Paul was prohibiting general authority or even good authority, because not all authority is bad, right? They say if Paul was Uh, prohibiting all authority whatsoever or good authority, there was 46 different words that he could use that would portray that. However, he chose to use this word, authenteo, which spoke of to have mastery over or to lord over. And so this type of authority, which is a domineering authority, is specifically what Paul is addressing. He's saying, I don't permit a woman to have this type of authority where you domineer and rule over and lord over the men in the church. Now, the question is, why did Paul use this word, authenteo, in this specific context? This is really important. 
Why did Paul use this word for authority out of 46 other options? And the answer is simply this. Ephesus, which is the city Paul's writing to, that's where Timothy was. Ephesus was a Greek city and it was known for its worship of Artemis, who was the Greek goddess. And Artemis had a massive temple. You can still see it if you ever go to Ephesus, it's crazy. There's this massive temple that was erected in the heart of the city to the Greek goddess Artemis. And in the Artemis cult, the Greeks, which is the culture that Paul's writing to here in Ephesus, the Greeks elevated women to positions of power where they ruled over men. So if you went into the primary mega church, if you would of Ephesus, the Artemis cult, there were women who were ruling and domineering men in the church because they worshiped a Greek goddess, Artemis. And so ultimately they believed that because Artemis authority was ultimate authority, women had more authority than men and therefore... Well, authority was passed down from women to men. So again, at this time, in again, the specific reason they believe Paul used this word is because many women had adopted a unbiblical view of authority from this common branch of paganism, the Artemis cult, and it had, it had crept into the church and Paul is addressing this specific thing. He's speaking to women who came out of this, this false unbiblical view of authority where women rule over and domineer men. It had crept into the church and this is specifically what Paul is addressing. He's saying, no, this is an issue. Women cannot exercise that type of authority, authenteo, like is happening in the Artemis cult. You cannot domineer and rule over and control men. That is unbiblical. Now, what's important to know, and this is very important, and I, I like this about the egalitarian perspective. It's important to remember that from the very start of this letter, the very start of this letter, Paul starts by saying his main concern to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.3. We don't have a slide, I don't think, but you can look in 1 Timothy 1.3. Paul said, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So notice the entire point of this letter from the beginning, Paul sets up the statement, I'm writing this letter because there's people teaching false doctrine. And Timothy, I don't want you to teach any other false doctrine. So now in chapter two, when he says, I don't permit a woman to exercise authenteo, domineering ruling authority, Paul was not permitting women to teach at Ephesus because they were deceived and they had overstepped their authority and they were teaching an unbiblical type of authority in the church. Does that make sense? The egalitarians say, this is corrective in nature. Paul is correcting women who had a false view of authority, a false unbiblical idea of authority saying, that should not happen in the church. This is kind of the key roots of their argument. So the egalitarians, they say, Paul ties his argument even back to Eve being deceived, not because women are more prone to spiritual deception and therefore should not be in positions of spiritual leadership, but rather he's saying, remember, Eve was deceived and there are women in this church who are deceived because they have believed the pagan lies of the Artemis cult and therefore I'm not permitting them to teach. Do you see that? So again, the commentarians say Eve was deceived and Adam was held responsible. This is why women can't be in these types of roles. The egalitarians say the, re the reference to Eve's deception is because there was women who were deceived and had a false view of authority in the church. And so he's telling them, you can't teach. You can't teach if you're spiritually deceived and if you have this wrong view of authority. So they believe, again, that egalitarians say, Paul is not prohibiting all teaching from women, but false teaching that is rooted in deception. They also make the observation that there's an emphasis. I want you to see, again, back in, look, look back at verse 11. The egalitarians notice and say this. In verse 11, it says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And then he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. There is an emphasis. And what's interesting, the only imperative command in this entire passage, the only imperative command is verse 11, let a woman learn. That's the only command imperative in the Greek. When Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach, that is not a command. The command and emphasis here he's saying is let a woman learn, which at this time would have been very progressive. Most of us read this in our day and age and we're like, whoa, this is restrictive and oppressive of women. When Paul said, let a woman learn, that would have blown people's minds at that time. 
So again, the, the, the primary command of the passage is let a woman learn. And so what the egalitarians say is the emphasis for a woman to learn comes before the prohibition for them to not teach, which may imply the reason Paul is not allowing them to teach in this particular context is because they had not properly learned and come to the knowledge of the truth. There was women who were coming out of the Artemis cult into the church who had a false view of authority. They had not properly learned God's roles for authority. And so he said, therefore, since you have not learned, I don't permit you to teach. Does that make sense? So this is again where the egalitarians kind of from this text say, hey, th this, is, this is not for all people, all churches, all times. He's addressing a very specific issue, speaking of a certain type of authority. And he's saying the reason that they can't teach is because they haven't first learned. Also, Number, the number two, and there, there's a million of these, by the way, a million arguments on both sides. The, the, the egalitarians as well, they not, only, which, uh, they, not, they not only look at this passage of scripture, but they say, when you look at the whole of scripture, which again, when we're interpreting a passage, we look at the immediate context, we look at what's happening in that culture, and we look at the broader framework of scripture because no scripture will contradict another portion of scripture. And so the egalitarian's argument is also rooted in the fact that when you look at the rest of the Bible and Paul's writings in particular, Paul actually held women in very high regards and many women served alongside Paul in ministry. In many of Paul's other writings, we see women uh, praying publicly in the church. We see women prophesying prophesying in the church. We see women sharing the gospel with men. We see uh, women being urged to use their gifts in the gathering of God's people over and over and over. They say, when you look at Paul's writings, you see that women were equally involved in ministry as Paul was, and many of them supported him. A few examples of that, Romans chapter 16, verse 1. Paul, in his writing to uh, the, the, in Romans, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant in the church. That word servant in the Greek language, it's diakonos. That's where we get the word deacon, that Phoebe was a diakonos, a servant in the church. Romans 16, verse three and four, Paul says, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ who risked their necks for my life. This was a couple, Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila. Paul says, look, give them greetings. Greet them, they are my fellow workers in Christ. Romans 16, verse six, he continues and he says, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. She was laboring there in the church as well. Philippians chapter four, I'm just throwing a bunch out for you. Philippians four, two and three. Paul says, I entreat Yodia and I entreat, who knows how to say that, Syntyche, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He says, greet these women who labored side by side with me in the gospel. Greet them because they're my co-laborers. Colossians 4.15, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Nympha is a woman who led a church in her own house in the early church. So again, the, and you could, the list goes on and on and on. But again, the, the big idea here is that Paul is saying here in this particular passage, it seems like Paul's prohibiting something that elsewhere, it seems like women were actually very involved in ministry. Also, if you wanna look later and read through 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians makes it very clear that women were praying and prophesying in the church. They were giving authoritative prophetic utterances in the church. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I'll, this is the final verse because I could do a million, but 1 Corinthians 14, 26, listen to what Paul says. He says, what then brothers... When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking to the entire church as well. And he says, when you guys come together, he says, each one, not just each man, each one, meaning every person in the body of Christ has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. So again, Paul is saying here that the church, in the church, Every person, men and women, has different gifts. And when the church comes together, we should all be able to use those gifts. So the egalitarians argue that the Bible nowhere restricts women from exercising the gifts of the Spirit. So the question is, 
why is it that all throughout the New Testament, which we just did a, a brief synopsis, but why is it that all throughout the New Testament and in Paul's letters, there were women serving alongside Paul in ministry, proclaiming the gospel with Paul, supporting Paul, building up and encouraging the church. But in this passage, Paul says that a woman cannot teach or exercise authority over a man. Why would Paul say that here if it seems like in the broader scope of scripture elsewhere, there were women who were as actively involved in ministry with Paul? And the egalitarians say it is because, again, there is a specific context that Paul was speaking into. And that context, again, was that there were women in the church of Ephesus who were overstepping their authority and had a unbiblical understanding of authority. And so Paul is correcting them. It is corrective in nature, not prescriptive in nature. Paul is saying these women in this context who have a false view of authority, I'm telling you, you can't use authority, which is why I'm not permitting you to teach over men. You need to first learn, come and learn. And the egalitarians would argue that if a woman is properly learned, that she then could be a teacher in the church as well. So again, these are some of the primary arguments. And again, there's so much more on both sides um, that, that we could go into if we had literally 20 hours to sit here. So we won't do that for now. So what I want to conclude with is this. What I want to conclude with is, is simply this. Whatever camp you do land in, whether you are strong complementarian, strong egalitarian, soft comp, somp egal, somewhere in the middle, kind of both, where, wherever you land on this particular issue, what we can all agree on is that women and men are equal in value, and equal in dignity, equal in worth, because we clearly see from the very beginning, God created male and female, man and woman, both in his image. This is what we can agree on. Men and women are completely equal in the sight of God. God has created us equal in worth, dignity, and value, having, making us in, having made us in his image. And therefore, men and women have equal access to the salvation that Jesus provided at the cross. Men and women are equally filled with God's spirit through faith in the finished work of God's cross. And we both have been called to make disciples of all nations. This is the great commission for every follower of Jesus. Men and women, our commission and calling in life, our purpose as we remain here on this earth, as long as God would have us here, is that we make disciples of all nations. That, that we go and we teach people to observe all that Christ has commanded. This is a commission for men and women. It's for the entire church that we're called to go and we're called to make disciples. And so my prayer for our church is that we would become the type of church, that we would become a church that equips and empowers both men and women alike to walk in the power of the Spirit, to make disciples of all nations, and to share the good news of Jesus with a lost and broken world. It's so sad and I think damaging that within a church, you can get so concerned with these theological nuances and debate this forever that we miss the big picture of the mission. That the mission is, hey, together, men and women, let's partner and go and spread the gospel. Let's partner and go and make disciples of all nations. Let's recognize the authority that we all have because we've been filled with the spirit. We've been created in the image of God and let's go and fulfill the great commission. That's the calling that God has placed on all of our lives. And so again, my prayer for our church um, is that again, that in this particular issue, there would be charity, that there would be grace, um, that this would not be something that brings division and divisiveness, but we'd say, wow, let me learn, let, let me listen to it. Why do you, but why are you a complementarian? Why are you an egalitarian? Why do you believe women can teach? Why don't you? And to create space to learn. I think that that would be a very beautiful, healthy demonstration for our, for, for our community, for church culture at large, because sadly this has become such a divisive issue. So again, as we go out, I want to end with just that note that we would be a church who just remains committed to the essentials, that we would be a church who's committed to the gospel, committed to making disciples. And that as we go out in the power of the spirit, both men and women alike would see our, our, our neighborhoods, our communities, our families, our work cultures being transformed by the power of the gospel, by the power of the spirit, amen?